Next is a question on the book tour. And Emma Sean asks, what was your favorite part about your book tour? I love meeting you at Homestead in Seattle. And uh, thank you for that question. So, you know, I came out with How to Make a Plant Love You in mid of July of 2019, and I have went on a lot of different places to go and do some book tours, book signings, and I'll be doing more also in 2020, so you can look on my events page and actually find where I'll be. And I guess like the favorite part of my book tour is actually meeting people and talking to you all because that is awesome. Like when we're working in a digital space, you get people who comment on your videos and things like that, but you don't really get a chance to talk with folks, you know, as a, in a more conversational way. Uh, I think like the digital field, I think a lot of people try to have conversations with me on Instagram and on YouTube, but it still feels... I don't know, it still feels weird to me. So being able to actually chat with folks in person really is for me my highlight, especially for folks who have shared with me that the channel or the book has really helped them through some hard times. And I think part of what How to Make a Plant Love You is sharing some of those community stories of how plants have helped them. And so I think there's just this like really good positive feedback loop of, um, you know, people helping people. And hearing that my channel could have such an impact in that way is very elucidating to me and re really reaffirming because, you know, sometimes I'm, I, I just come out there and I'm like, let's talk about the, the propagation and care of Eripsalis. And you think that people are going to get out of that video, um, you know, propagation advice, but they actually get something more. And, um, and I love that, that you could actually put content out there and that you get something um, beyond of what you think would, would go out there. The other thing that was really revelatory for me was, uh, was that when I asked people how, how long have they been caring for plants or interested in plants, and a lot of folks had said only the last one or two years, which is crazy. And um, a number of folks had mentioned that they really got into plants because of you know seeing my videos. And, and that is just really remarkable to me. I mean, again, it's just like this really reaffirming that um, you know, the stuff that I'm doing actually has a positive influence and a positive impact in people's lives. And that makes me want to do it more. You know, there's, there's no huge financial gain from, from doing these videos, at least not now. Um, so, you know, what are the other things that you're getting in, in the process? And I think that has been, uh, has been really, really wonderful to, to see. And that's only through, um, meeting people like you. So again, thank you, Emma Sean, for that, that question. All right, so next question is on moving. I got a few questions on moving, but I just took Kelsey Malik's. Do you feel you are outgrowing your space? Would you ever consider moving to a bigger place that has land? Yes, I always feel like I'm outgrowing my space. And would I consider moving and having a piece of land? Yes. I think I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> when that will happen, who knows? All right, so I had a lot of questions on Kippy. And... Thank you, everybody. You know, I have to say, I got a beautiful headstone in the mail from somebody who I still don't know who gave me the headstone for Kippy. And for those of you who don't know, Kippy was my little Rhode Island red foster hen, and I lost her on November 3rd. And it just makes me so sad because she died very quickly, and there was nothing, nothing I could have done about it. And I went through this whole stage of grief. And sometimes when I'm in a mood, I, I, I think of her and it makes me sad. I'm okay right now, um, but, but Lil Sissy 12 who I know loved following Kippy, says, Will you be getting another chicken? I know Kippy cannot be replaced, but for companionship. Leaping Through Life said, Will you get another fowl friend? And um, Barbara Ali says, Whenever I see the post about Kippy, she reminds me of my parrot Denise, who I lost just a few days ago. Do you have any plan to adopt any animal in the future? And um, all I could say right now is that, you know, for me, I wasn't really seeking out a chicken living in my apartment. Um, Kippy really did find me, and I leaned into that. And, um, and I couldn't get rid of her. You know, she was just so connected. Um, we had such a wonderful relationship. I mean, I basically carried that bird on my stomach and on my shoulder for about two and a half years. And, and we had just such an incredible bond. 
I take care of a bunch of other chickens at the Senior Citizen Service Center. That's actually where I would board her if I had to, you know, go on a trip or anything like that. Yeah, and it's not the same. You know, the relationships that I have with those birds are not the same as I had with Kippy. And I think that it's just really challenging having a, a chicken. You know, it's really having a challenge, you know, keeping chickens, you know, in the city context. And of course, one, you know, in your home is extra challenging, especially one that's attached to you so much. So I'm probably not going to lean into having another chicken unless like something miraculously finds me. But I do have to say that from the 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 other side of that coin is that um, it's made things a little bit easier, meaning I don't feel so guilty when I go away on a trip. Like I thought about her daily whenever I would go away and I've, I felt guilty and I wanted to get back to see her. And I think that's probably the way that parents often feel about their children um, or maybe even about, you know, people feel about their pets, no matter what the pet is. So with Kippy, I was always very concerned. And I think that, you know, some of my trips in the last weeks with my book tour, you know, I, I don't want to get into it, but like there were there were things that I think I could have safeguarded her health maybe a little bit more. And I think this is going through the stages of, of grief still. But, um, you know, she essentially laid an egg inside and that invited a bacterial infection. So she probably didn't have enough calcium. And, you know, part of me is like, oh, I wish I had more eggshells to have given her, but I couldn't, I couldn't do it all. Like I couldn't, I couldn't be there, you know, with her or for her. Um, and, um, and, you know, that's just a common thing that happens with chickens too. Um, having them like lay an egg internally and um, and then invites a bacterial infection. It's especially with like egg laying hens like that. So um, so I, I think that's a lot, it's been a lot of heartache and a lot of loss for me. Um, I think about her daily. I have this like little collection of feathers that I find around the house now and again that I've put together in a little basket. Um, so I don't think I'll have one, but if I ever do move out of the city and I move into the country, one of the first things that I'm going to get is a chicken coop. <laughs> Mark my words there. <laughs> All right. So I have, um, some plant questions in general, and thank you for sticking with me. If you're sticking through all these, um, questions and answer ses sessions, I, there are so many more, but I'm going to end on the, the plants notes. So Joy Loved Grass says, how do you know when a genus has been recategorized, such as when Sansevieria became Dracaena? Do you have to actively and manually search for the info? Where do you get such info? Or do expert or these experts send out newsletters, memos, whatever, to plant people when there is a genus switch? I wish there was like a newsletter, a big general newsletter that would went out. Um, no, I actually find from talking to other botanists, experts, uh, I also read science journals, believe it or not. So if I could show you my hard drive, I have this thing called research and I will get really interested in like a specific topic and I will just like research all about that one specific topic about what's out there in the peer reviewed literature. And so I probably have like hundreds and hundreds of, um, of science journal articles or articles that I find online. And oftentimes I come across these things where uh, a genus gets changed. Um, and sometimes I'll go over to Tropicos or Q and see what the latest genus change has been. And sometimes that latest genus change could have been like four or five years ago. In the case of um, Sansevieria becoming Dracaena, that was I think around 2014, if I'm not mistaken. And I only found about, out about that when I was in Thailand and some of the botanists and experts there had been talking about it. I was like, wait, when did that actually happen? So, you know, one of the things that I think people have already always like, you know, not made fun of, but just like joked on the channel is all the times where I'm like the bearer of bad news when like, the Senecio genus like blows up and becomes like Kleinia and Curio and Capuzia and all those others. And then like Sansevieria becomes Dracaena and then people are like, oh, and they get angry. But, um, but no, I mean, I think that uh, there's been so much more studies in the last, you know, decade on plant genomes that you, they look at the floral structure and now they're looking at the genomes um, and they're saying, okay, well, this is clearly in the same genus or it's separated. And I think that more of this is going to happen as more and more botanists and taxonomists start to look at the, the genetic structure of, of plants. 
So, uh, yeah, so I just try to stay on top of it through um, a quick search and then a little bit of a deeper dive into the scientific literature and or also talking with um, experts and botanists in the field. But even sometimes, um, you know, botanists don't even know because they might, again, and this goes back to my thing about like when you pick a specific field, the trend in science is to be really, really focused on a particular subject. So you might get somebody who's like incredibly um, well versed in the world of cycads or specific cycad or cycad pollination, for instance, and might not know anything about, um, not anything, but like might not know much about um, another family or genus of plants. So sometimes you have to pick, you know, the experts in the field and try to rely on them for that specific subject of plants, if that makes sense. So there's no silver bullet solution of finding that unless you're actually out there actively pursuing it. So I wish there were. <laughs> Maybe that's one of the things that I'll do is uh, say this week or this month or this year in plants. Um, so that gave me a great idea. So thank you, Joy Loved Grass. Um, Maybe I will just go and do that. Okay, so X Ruth. What plants are on your wish list? Where do you source your plants from? So what plants are on my wish list? I'm not really at this point actively buying any plants. Um, I just kind of sometimes get like this spontaneous, like, ooh, that, that's interesting, you know, variety of plants. Or I think that um, I've been really into Ripsalis lately. Um, some Hoyas, you know, here and there. Serapegias, I actually really like. I mean, these kind of like green stick plants that everyone makes fun of me for having. But I like them. I like them a lot. I think they're really unique and interesting, and I think they work well um, between plants. Um, there's some... Mm, there's a couple caladiums that don't go dormant that I'm like interested in and looking at. Um, more Some ferns that are a bit more um, tough uh, that I think could be interesting that you could grow in a little bit more higher light conditions, which I think is interesting that I, I I'd like to try out, but, um, and where do I source my plants from? I mean, any and everywhere, because I usually get very interested in a specific kind of plant and then I'll search for that. I'm like, okay, where do I get that? So I still shop around my, my local plant shops, but if there's like specific varieties, I often will go on eBay, Etsy. Um, you could find a lot of hobby growers, um, growing specific types of plants. Like I'm always like getting peperomia here and there. So, you know, so I, I, I think, um, I think it's just basically everywhere. I mean, there's, I don't even know, like, I can't even think like Steve's leaves is like a place that I go for, um, a lot of interesting peperomia or like begonias. And then you have like Enid from NSC tropicals. If you want like aeroids and some interesting ones right there, I don't, actively bring in a lot of plants from other countries. Like if I go to the International Aroid Show or something like that, then I might actually purchase some of those plants from the different um, countries. But mind you, if they're coming over from those different countries, they should be sturdy plants because they've traveled a long time. You had to take them bare root. They get sprayed with stuff. Like, you know, they it's harder for them to acclimate and adjust to your home. So you could probably have a lot of like plant die off. So that's something that you have to kind of keep in mind. So even when I brought plants in from the Netherlands, they got held up in, in customs a little bit um, and not all of them, you know, really survived very well. But the ones that survived the best were like really tough succulents, for instance, that had like succulent roots as well. So, um, so yeah, so I think that uh, you can't be afraid for buying online, especially if you like some more interesting varieties of plants. That's what I have to share. So Sasa Young asks, who waters your plants when you're out traveling and seeing all these kinds of places? So I have uh, the benefit of being around many different plant shops and I just basically hire somebody from one of those plant shops in order to be able to take care of my plants. And typically I have them come in every two to three days to just check on and water my plants. There's always some die offs when you get back and you just have to come and accept that. I mean. I have the story of one of my Calathea zebrinas, which I actually don't have at the moment anymore, but my Calathea zebrina um, got mealybugs um, with uh, 
gentleman by the name of Amos. He was like trying to clean them off and everything like that. And I was like, Amos, I'm like, don't worry about it. Like, don't spend your time focusing just on that one plant. Just put it in the, um, just quarantine it in the, uh, in the um, shower and then I'll have to deal with it when I get back. Um, by that time, it was like, it was just riddled with mealybugs. I could have probably cut it back and, and cleaned off the soil, but I, I didn't. I had to actually dispose of that plant. But um, you'll always have some, some diebacks when somebody else is taking care of your plants. You'll have diebacks when you're taking care of your plants too. But, um, but I think when I travel, I, I try, if I'm gone for like two or three days, then I usually won't bring anybody in. If I'm gone for more than three days, then I usually will bring somebody in to come in at least once to check on my plants. And I, and I, I pay people. I think that it's too much to ask for a friend to be able to do something. You know, if you have like five, 10 plants, you know, maybe a friend will come in and take care of them. But um, when you have so many, it becomes a little overwhelming. And I've had people come into my place and just be, are completely overwhelmed and they never want to come back. So, <laughs> so that, um, that's happened too. So Steina Mork says, what plants are trendy now and which plants do you foresee will be trending next? So um, Steina, really good question. I mean, I think that um, sometimes I find even when I launch something on 365 days of plants, I'll have growers connect, connect with me and they're like, oh my God, I'm the only person who sells that plant and like that plant's already sold out. So I think sometimes when, when I even like put a plant on there, it'll actually like get trend for a little while. But I think plants that you know probably right now are trending are still aroids, you know, um, interesting monsteras, philodendrons, um, you know, plants like that, uh, raphidophoras, uh, those are really interesting for people and I think they will keep on trending for a while because they're relatively, depending on the species, they're relatively easy to kind of take care of in the home. I would love to see Ripsalis trend a little bit more. I think in like when I went to Europe, like in the Netherlands, and um, in the UK, they have huge ripsalis that people are using as like curtains, you know, hanging from, we, we don't have that here in the States. They're not really grown out that large in the States. So I think we'll start to see a little bit more of that. Um, although I think that they don't give, get big blooms. Um, people have to really love them for the leaves. But I think what's interesting about them is that there's only so many species that it's actually something that you can have a whole collection of. Um, and I think that there's a really special story to be told there because I'd like to see more of those go into cultivation in a proper kind of way. One, because they're easy to propagate, but two, because so many of those are endangered or going extinct in the wild. Um, with the recent fires kind of happening um, in, in the deforestation that's happening at such an uh, unprecedented rate in the Amazon, um, I think that there is uh, there needs to be some more interest there. And I, I do have to say that the terrible things that are happening, the, the bushfires that are happening in Australia, I mean, oh, there's so, going to be so many plants that are lost that really the only way that we're going to have many of those plants are in cultivation, are in um, botanic gardens. So hopefully when the fires subside in a lot of those areas and if anybody and if everybody kind of decides to be more mindful of the regional needs and the ecosystem needs of our planet as a whole then perhaps the plants that we have in cultivation we could actually bring them back into their native habitats so um i went off onto a little little tirade right there. But I do think that aroids are going to continue to trend. I'd like to see interesting plants like cynantrums, um, ripsalis, syrigias, these kind of interesting ones kind of trend a little bit more that don't have these like big leaves. Um, I think there's interesting syndapsis, which are also aroids that are coming out. I'm kind of looking around at my plants. Hoyas, I think, of, of course, are also going to be still very popular. And, um, and different cultivars. People are um, starting to experiment with different plants. There's a lot of interesting ones that I've seen that will not be revealed yet, but I know once they are revealed on the channel, people will be like, oh my God, how could I get that one? Um, and I don't need to mean to fuel any type of obsession because I think somebody's asked this question, I don't have it here, but somebody asked this question, how do you know when enough is enough? And that's like me trying to tell you when you're full after eating. You yourself know when you're full. Like 
you yourself know what your plants give you. And, um, and you should have that, that balance and that acknowledgement of that balance because um, it's a little bit of an obsession right now and that's not healthy. I think um, you could be in, interested and you could have a hobby and it's intriguing and it gives you all sorts of different um, other things from it. Like you could meet wonderful people through the, through the plant world. For me, I have to find that balance for myself and my balance is not going to be your balance and it's not going to be your friend or the next person sitting next to you's balance as well. So you have to understand what plants give you and maintain that, that balance for you. And at some point in your life, it may be too much plants and you need to pare back or at some point in your life, you feel like you need more of them. Um, and that's really up to you. So for me, this is wonderful for me, but um, it might not be wonderful for somebody else. So finding that balance I think is important and understanding what are the qualities and what are the things that you're getting? What are the positives that you're getting from the plants that you have? And if it starts to stress you out, if it starts to defeat the purpose of why you started them in the first place, then I would say then it, it, it may be time to cut back to a certain degree, give your plants away or, or something. So that's, that's important for you to, to know and that's only for you to decide. Um, this is kind of related. Plant Dad has asked, do you ever regret having so many plants and is it harder to make plans and take trips with so many? No, I, I don't really regret um, having plants. I think the only time that I was really stressed was if you remember me talking about all the stories of having the construction workers here and I had to move all my plants away and put them into the center of my space. And that was really stressful because even though I have a lot of plants, they really do feel like they're in their own spaces. I mean, as I get new plants in, as I'm repotting, they, you know, some of them kind of get out of place. But um, they eventually have their own place on the windowsill or on the shelves, and I know where they are. When I had construction workers in my house, that was so stressful because they were bumping into my big ficus lyrata, and I had to cut it back. Like, that was really sad for me. Um, I couldn't really water my plants when they're in the internal uh, area of my space. And, and I had so much changes in my house. They ripped out all the electric they had to put that back in. They took out all my windows. They put new windows in. Um, they ran all new heating units. I had to get a heating unit. I had to move one of my um, cupboards and get rid of it. And now they have heating units and all that stuff used, should be on the inside of the walls, but they had to put it on the outside of the walls. So that really changed the dynamic of my space. Um, they st and they're still not done. They have to put gas lines. They have to punch a hole through my um, bathroom wall in order to be able to have this vent. Um, they had punched holes through my other side of the wall in order to put a fire escape because I didn't have a fire escape for 14 years, like go figure. So, <clears throat> you know, there's so much that had to happen and that was like really stressful when you have so many plants. Luckily, most of that has subsided. There, like I said, there's still a few um, things here and there and most of the plants are back in their place and that makes me feel much better. So, but no, no regrets. I mean, I, this has been a slow grow, you know, I've, I've been growing plants for almost 11 years now in this place. So, um, it's been a, a gradual increase. It's not like I started last year and I have 300. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a gradual increase in my place and, uh, plants provide me a lot of, really, they really feed my curiosity. I like to trial um, plants that have maybe are not typical house plants and see how they would, uh, would, would react in my space. And sometimes that goes well and sometimes it goes bad and I just kind of record my observations and, and they, they provide relaxation and calm, um, all sorts of things. So, so no, yeah, I, I, um, I mean, thank you for the question, but um, I haven't had any regrets. And it does make traveling a little bit more challenging, but I could rely on some good people. Like I said, I have um, I hire people from plant shops, so at least they have a little bit of a, a sensibility for the, the plants that I have. Pre-War Forest says, plant poaching is rarely talked about in the community, but it has become a huge issue with, uh, with Dudleya being stripped in the coast of California, cacti seeds being smuggled from all of the Americas, and cycad poachers removing critically endangered plants from South Africa. Is there anything we could do as consumers to reduce the threat of plant poaching uh, on our few plants that are out there? 
Really great question, and you probably see that I started to address some of this in the plant one on me's and also sometimes on Instagram. So I always try to bring in this element of conservation and protection and the things that we could do as consumers in kind of keeping plants in cultivation. I think that um, I don't have all the answers to this question, but one of the things that I had mentioned with um, Anders in at the Nang Nuch in Thailand, if you um, heard me talk about that with cycads, is like, one of the things that we could do is actually put some of these plants into cultivation and actually make them more available. Um, I think that one, we need more um, uh, funds that go into the conservation of plants. Uh, that is one thing that if you read about in my book, most of the, the conservation monies will go to animals, um, which I think is do, duly needed and there's probably a, a dearth of funding for for animals too but the vast majority of animals obviously rely on ecosystems and plants really make an intact ecosystem so I think that if we could funnel a bit more funds to kind of like plant conservation we'd have a lot more answers to that I think buying from reputable sellers like asking those folks as to where they're getting their seeds, if they're growing from seed, um, if they're propagating them from them themselves. Like I went to Steve's Leaves, uh, you know, facility, and he's like propagating from the, the from the plants that he has, and then sometimes he'll order from other sellers uh, and then grow those out. And so, in some way, I'm 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 thinking like, well, it's not bad if there's people who are spreading more of that uh, species out there for more people to grow, but it's also bad if you're actually removing them from the wild places. And I'm not a person who needs a plant so desperately enough that um, I would go out of my way to uh, pay somebody or um, do it myself and remove a plant from the environment because part of me is like, I'd rather have the intact environment. I'd rather have intact environments over houseplants any day. Um, and, and actually the, one of the reasons why I have houseplants here in New York City is I, I'm not able to actually have my own land to grow plants at this, at this stage in time. And, and I would love that. But you know, in the, in the interim, I have these plants with me. And so um, sometimes you don't know all that information, but being able to ask your sellers, especially if it's a new seller that you don't have a relationship with, where they're sourcing the plants, how they're sourcing them for the plants, be be inquisitive. Like that is one way to be able to do it. And um, and you could be active. You could support more plant conservation as well, which I think is really important. And that plant conservation could actually happen in your own local communities. The first place that you could go is maybe to any local botanical garden because a lot of botanic gardens have, um, it's part of their mission in order to be able to have conservation of local plants as well. And, um, and so I think uh, becoming more educated, being more inquisitive, asking questions, and not necessarily always pursuing the rarity of a plant. I know that there's like this kind of like obsession with the rarity You'll notice that I don't often say that <laughs> across my posts and in videos. Um, and it, part of it is because I wanna, I wanna instill a little bit more of the message of conservation and the role that we play as, um, as houseplant enthusiasts and houseplant owners in the, the whole mix. Um, plus I've heard from a lot of folks that, that, um, that, uh, that they get this anxiety over uh, this rare plant and that rare plant and this rare plant. And I don't, I don't want to, um, I can't, I have no control over those person's emotions, but I don't want to necessarily purposely instill that in anybody. So hopefully we get to a point where we have more interest in plants, more funding towards plants. And the only way to do that is not by saying, oh, let's hope this happens, but actually becoming and being involved. And of course, more botanical literacy. So Hopefully a channel like this um, becomes also a, a place where people could actually learn and figure out how to get more involved in their local neighborhoods and on a regional and um, international level. Kind of two more questions. Flower Power says, hey Summer, I love your channel. It's so full of info to the point it's too much. <laughs> Good, I'm like, it's too much information. Sometimes people say it's not enough. Anyways, my questions are, what was your first plant? 
when did your plant craze start? What's your favorite plant? Um, okay, so, and then do you ever get the urge to get a huge plot of land somewhere where you will have your personal sustainable botanical garden? Ooh, that sounds really nice. Like a blank slate where you could just paint out your amazing collection. Love the questions. Um, a lot of these answers I answered really early on in, in the first parts of Plant Went On Me, but first plant, my ficus lyrata, which I still have to this day. It's about a, I don't know, nine, 10, 11 years old. Where did you, when did your plant craze start? I mean, I've always been interested in nature. And I think as you, if you've sat through this, you just realize that um, I have um, studied this growing up and, um, and has, have always been in, involved in kind of plants in some way, shape and form. And, um, and I think I started to grow plants when my roommate moved out and that was about 11 years ago now and have been growing plants indoors in my space here and also have a community garden as of three years ago here in the city. Uh, what's my favorite plant? The genus of Peperomia. I know you guys are probably rolling your eyes because I say that a lot, but that really hasn't changed. I love peps. And then, do you ever get an urge to get a huge pot of land somewhere? I mean, absolutely. <laughs> I think about it. I think about it regularly. So um, I get a lot of chance to go up to the country um, and hopefully more in 2020. So perhaps that will be in my future. All right. And then I, I just have to read this because this is the kind of the last, um, this is not a question, but I just wanted to say, this is Israel Dale 7165. This is not a question, but I just wanted to say that your long form episodes have been getting better and better over the last few months. The Thailand episodes, all the Queen Surrogate Botanical Garden tour tours and the Nang Nuch Saiket episode especially are astonishingly beautiful and informative. As a plant lover, I've never before seen such wholesome and enjoyable content on YouTube. Kudos and thank you for all, your, all you do. Israel Dale, thank you so much for letting me know. I think all of those comments and um, testimonials and everything really helped me move forward with the channel because like I said, this is a labor of love. Um, uh, Sonder, who's my camera person, is, is really appreciative as well. And, um, and I just wanna say thank you to all of you. Thank you for all of your thoughtful questions. And I really do hope that it opened up a little bit more behind the veil of why I do what I do and how we do what we do and, um, and there's more to come for you in 2020. And I'll try to do more of these Q and A's soon, sooner rather than later. I feel like, you know, three years is way too long to, to wait for Q and A's. All right, guys. Bye.